Well, King Louis XII of France articulated that feeling that many people have when he said, nothing smells so sweet as the dead body of your enemy. Revenge and retaliation are popular reactions in our society these days. But the truth is, for the believer, that the ability to forgive is both distinctively Christian and divinely liberating. Freedom and a happy heart truly become ours when we forgive. Amen? And ultimately, forgiveness does what no one expects it to do. It brings happiness to the heart. Today we're wrapping up our series, The Happy Heart, and this is the fourth installment. We've looked at three other principles, and today we're looking at the fourth principle, which is the happy heart forgives. It's a very basic tenet of the Christian faith. But if you are unable to forgive, you will ensure that you will live life in an unhappy manner. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 21 and 22, just to recap, not going to read through the whole section again, but verse 21 says, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to to seventy times seven I want us to look today at four relational aspects of happiness and forgiveness. They go hand in hand. They are tied to each other. And so we want to look at these aspects so that we too can be happy in heart. Let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer and ask him to bless this message. Father, we come before you and ask you to speak through your word. I pray that you would loose my lips, that you would help me to simply say what you have already said. Help me to communicate it to the best of my ability. May your spirit pour through me. May the hearts that are listening to this message be receptive, and may they be changed forever because of you and because of your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. The first one I want us to take a look at is this. The happy heart understands the frequency of forgiveness. The happy heart understands the frequency of forgiveness. We see that in verse 21 and 22, which we just read. But... We have to understand the context. We're always talking about context in this church. We're always preaching it and teaching it. It's important not to take a scripture and rip it out of its context. No, we want to see the surrounding passages so we can have a better understanding of what is happening. So in verse 21 and 22, Peter asked the Lord a question. It's a question that maybe you have asked and I have asked. How many times am I supposed to forgive someone? Is it seven times? Is that enough? You see, in verse 15 through 17, it gives us some context. If you're with me this morning, you're awake, say amen. Amen. In verse 15 of chapter 18, Jesus says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again I say to you that if you, two, or three, two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Now... What is happening here is Jesus is giving instruction for who? For the church, for Christians. This is for believers, okay? It's important to understand that because all throughout the context of the sermon today, all throughout the message, you have to keep in mind that this is for Christians and how Christians should treat other Christians. It's applicable to Christians and non-believers as well, but ultimately and mainly it's for how Christians should treat other Christians, And so when Peter asks in verse 21, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Remember, he's speaking of his brother in Christ, his fellow Christians. And in light of this teaching by Christ, Peter wants to know the frequency. How often, to what extent should we forgive and allow someone in the church 
to repent and be restored to fellowship. Peter ultimately asked, is there a limit? To which Jesus says, no. Peter here is being really spiritual, at least he thinks he is. You see, in Jewish tradition, the amount of times that we're uh, allowed to forgive someone is up to three times. They took that from the book of Amos. God, to the nations around Israel, forgives them three times. He says, okay, four. And it's this idea that they ripped off from God. It wasn't even meant for Christians. They ripped off, it wasn't even meant for Israelites. And they say, you know, three times is about the max. That's what the children of Israel believe. That's what the teachers were teaching. And so Peter, knowing that, he doubles it and then for good measure says plus one. Not just three times, six times, and even one more, seven times. God, Jesus, is, is this good? This is pretty good, right? Seven times, surely that's enough times to get, forgive my brother or sister in Christ. Jesus says to him what? Seventy times seven. Now, it's not 70 multiplication seven. It's not 490. It's 70 times plus seven. Seventy times plus seven. Seventy-seven times. But of course, Jesus is not being even literal there. His point is to say, in limitless amount is what you should be forgiving your brother or sister in Christ. He says, forgiveness is to be limitless. Because if 77, when you get to a point and somebody sins against you 77 times, if you're that forgiving and you have that type of heart, if they do it 78 times, what are you going to do? Now you cross the line, right? No, you keep forgiving. And that's Jesus' point. For the believer, for the Christian... Our forgiveness has no end. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have committed the same sin against the same person more than once? We all have, right? If you're married, especially, probably. If you have kids, definitely, right? We all have because this is in our nature. We not only don't get it right the first time, we don't get it right the 222nd time. We need to be forgiven every single day, often multiple times in a single day. And that's true because of our nature. Galatians 5, 17 is on the screen. Let's look at it together. Paul is speaking to the Galatians. He says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. He's saying there's two natures within us. We have the old nature, and as believers, we have the new nature, and they are opposed to one another. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. How many, how many can attest to this? Amen? You have good intentions. You want to serve the Lord. You want to do what's right. And yet you find yourself not doing the things you want to do. And you find yourself not doing the things that you want to do. You find yourself doing the things that you don't want to do. The things you want to do, Paul says. He says, I don't do. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do do. And I'm saying a lot of things. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But you know what I'm saying. Amen? It's hard. This is the battle that is going on within us. It's our nature fighting against our new nature. So first things first. We must get this in our head and hearts first and foremost. It's imperative that we, even Christians, understand and anticipate the frequent sin of our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's imperative that we remember that our brothers and sisters in Christ are struggling with that nature that we struggle with. They are going to sin. You see, this is what happens sometimes in a church. People come into a church, they like it, everybody's treating them nice, they're here for a while, and this can be any church, not just our church. Maybe a few weeks go by, maybe a few months, maybe a few years, and then somebody does something to them or says something to them, And they are just shocked. I can't believe that person would do that to me. And so they leave the church. And in reality, if they would have just remembered, they struggle with their sin, just like I struggle with my sin, maybe they would still be in that church. See, it's going to happen. So we shouldn't be surprised when it does happen. This will prepare our hearts to grant forgiveness anyways. This is the attitude of the believer. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, very clearly, 
And very adamantly, he says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Verse 4, and if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Jesus' teaching on the frequency of forgiveness is very clear. You were always to forgive. Now, this doesn't mean you have to put up with abuse, right? If you're in a business relationship and the person steals from you one time, two times, three times, four times, you can still forgive them, but maybe you're not a partner with them any longer, right? <laughs> it's okay to make wise decisions. It's okay to remove yourself from, from relationships. Not, we're not talking about marriage, but from friendships and relationships where the person is abusive, where the person is, is, is always being negative, where the person is lying to you, stealing from you. We're not talking about just being a doormat for anyone. But someone can hurt you multiple times, and we can still forgive. In fact, we are commanded to forgive. You see, there is to be no record-keeping amongst Christians. I think this is first and foremost in the marriage relationship. Christian, are you listening? You ought not keep a record of wrongs in your marriage. You ought not keep a record of wrongs in your family. You ought not keep a record of wrongs in your church family. John MacArthur says, Record keeping is not to be considered, and a Christian with a forgiving heart thinks nothing about it. He says he forgives the hundredth offense or the thousandth just as readily and graciously as the first, because that is the way he is forgiven by God. The inclination of sinful man is to return evil for what? For evil. That is the inclination of our hearts. But God's standard is just the opposite. Jesus said to return good for evil and to do it without limits. Do you see how otherworldly this is? How supernatural in its very nature this is? This is completely unlike the world. And in that it has power. Romans chapter 5 verse 20 says, Now the law, that is just think about the Ten Commandments. There were many more than that, but just think about the Ten Commandments. The law came in to increase the trespass. Why do we have the Ten Commandments? To obey them, yes. But can anyone obey the Ten Commandments completely and to its entirety and perfectly? No. The purpose of the law is to show us that. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is to show us we cannot keep the Ten Commandments. Amen? Amen? But the verse continues, but where sin increased, where we kept breaking the law, what happened? Grace abounded all the more. You see, the Christian is not to keep a ledger, it's not to keep a notepad, a diary that says, so-and-so did this to me today. My wife said this again today. And to keep racking up all the things that have done wrong against us, people who have hurt us and sinned against us, that is not to be the attitude of the Christian. See, the law keeps count, but grace keeps forgiving. Love keeps no record of wrongs, the Bible says, and grace ultimately is the mark of a believer. Forgiveness is to be without limit. That's number one. The happy heart understands the frequency of forgiveness, and the frequency of forgiveness is limitless. Secondly, the happy heart, if you want to truly be happy in your heart of hearts, you have to understand the depth of forgiveness. So it's not just the number, but it's the depth of forgiveness that matters. Look at verse 23 through, 20, through 35. I want to read these again just to kind of give us a glimpse into what's happening. Verse 23, for this reason, remember, Peter just asked the Lord, how many times? Seven times? And Jesus says no. Basically, he says in a limitless amount, 70 times seven. Verse 23, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. Now, slaves here is a generic term. It basically means a subject because in that time, a slave in the kingdom, everybody was a slave in the kingdom. They're subjects to the king, right? He says in verse 24, when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. 
But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. See, what we see happening here is Jesus is telling a parable. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? It might be real, it might not be real. But Jesus is trying to communicate a point through this parable. And the context then is then, it's a parable about, he says in verse 23, the kingdom of heaven. He says it in the very first part. For, the, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. So we have to decipher some things here. What's happening in this story? If it's a parable, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Who is who? Well, first of all, the certain king that you see in verse 23 is who? It's God. The king is God. Okay, we're talking about... A parable, it's representative of something of a deeper meaning, of a spiritual meaning. So the king represents God. And then the slaves are all believers. We are in his kingdom. We are his subjects, okay? And then the specific slave, the specific person, is someone who has trusted in Christ, has been forgiven by God because of Jesus Christ, of all of their debt. The sinner lost in his debt to God is the slave who owed the king 10,000 talents, okay? So you kind of get a picture of what's really going on here and what Jesus is trying to communicate, what he is communicating. Verse 24, I want you to notice, it says, When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him how much? 10,000 talents. How much is 10,000 talents? Well, from historical documents of the time, it's been recorded that the total annual revenue collected by the Roman government from four provinces in the region, in the area, added up to about 900 talents. So based on those figures, 10,000 talents amounted to more than 11 years of taxes from four provinces in the area. That's a lot of money. Really what Jesus is saying when he uses the phrase 10,000 talents is it's, it's incalculable. It's an amount that you can't really even tally. And the word that is used here for 10,000 is the Greek word myrios. It's where we get in the Bible the word myriad. It means thousands upon thousands upon ten thousands of thousands. And it's used in a figurative manner to represent a vast, uncountable number. So Jesus' point in this parable was that the man who owed the king 10,000 talents owed an unpayable debt. That's what he's saying here. You see, this man who was a servant, a subject, a slave of the king, was going out, he's collecting taxes, and guess what he was doing with those taxes? He's stealing, right? He's taking what is the king's. And he's taking all this money, and over this time, he's, he's incurred this incalculable debt to the king. He is to put it lightly, in over his head. There is no way, if he worked for a thousand years, he could pay this money back. It is an incalculable and unpayable debt. And so Jesus' point in this parable, therefore, was that the man who owed the king 10,000 talents owed an unpayable debt. Sound familiar? That's you. That's me. We owe God an unpayable debt. Our sin is so grave and so great, even one single sin against God is unpayable by us. <laughs> See, the depth of our sin is incalculable and unpayable. It is beyond our finite minds, and we are unable to comprehend its extent. Every single person who has ever existed outside of Jesus Christ is indebted to God and is unable to pay him back. That's why Paul said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? He knew that his debt, that his sin would condemn him, would separate him from God forever. And he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who is going to set me free from this body of death? Isaiah the prophet, in his vision of the Lord, 
when he saw the Lord in all his glory, he uttered in great angst, Woe is me. Why? He says, For I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You think about Ezra. Ezra 9, 6. This is Ezra prayer. He says, Oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities have risen above our heads, and our guilt has grown even to the heavens. You see, this is the attitude of anybody that truly comes to salvation in Jesus Christ. Are you listening? Say amen. If you've come to faith in Christ and you have recognized and understood, not completely because I think that's impossible, but you have sensed the depth and the depravity of who you are at your core, you feel your sin against the holy God. That is what drives you to trust in Christ because you know there is nothing in you that can save you. You cannot do enough good deeds in order for God to give you a pass. You know because God is holy and righteous and just and perfect in his nature and he cannot be in the same room with sin. You know that you need something from outside to save you from within. You need someone else to do the work that you cannot do. You need someone else to pay off the debt that you could never pay. And so you trust in Christ and what he did on the cross. You hear in Ezra's voice an understanding of his deep depravity and his sin against God. See, the depths of our sin and depravity is realized only when we see it against the absolute holiness of God. When the believer has a clear understanding of the depth of sin that he has been forgiven... When you see what you have been forgiven from, it enables you to forgive any sin committed against you. When you see clearly what God has forgiven you of, it becomes easy to forgive others their sins. Amen? Amen. At least that's how it should be. Now I'm right there with you. It's still hard because I forget how sinful I really am. See, for the believer, there is no sin we cannot forgive. But we say things like, I can forgive just about anything, but, but, but that, right? I can't forgive her for that. When we say things like that, it proves our immature and incomplete understanding of the depth of sin that we have been forgiven ourselves. I want you to look at verse 28, 29, and 30 with me. He says, in this story, but that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Think about that. Think about what this man was just forgiven 10,000 talents. An unpayable amount, right? He's forgiven so much. 11 years worth of taxes that this man stole. He's just wiped clean. And what does he do? He goes out and he finds the person that owes him, let's just say, 100 bucks. And he begins to choke him and say, give me back my money. It's inconceivable. It's unimaginable that someone would do this. Amen? Until we realize that that's me. I've been forgiven an immeasurable debt, and yet I refuse to forgive the most petty offense. How many are you, of you are with me on that? We get petty, don't we? I can't, I, I can't forgive them of that. I can't believe they said that about me. There is no sin you cannot forgive. My wife and I have a saying in our marriage. If it's, if it's not adultery... Get over it. Not bad, right? But lately I've been thinking, even if it was adultery, I need to at least forgive. It doesn't mean the consequences don't happen. The Bible allows for divorce in two circumstances, one of which is adultery. It doesn't mean you can't separate from that person. I don't think that's the best always. It's up to the individual person. But the point is simply this. Forgiveness is always required. 
Forgiveness is always required. No matter what happens to you, no matter what the other person does to you, you do not have a right to hold on to anything. Amen? There is no sin you cannot forgive. I suggest you write that in your notes and personalize it. There is no sin I cannot forgive. If you write that down, if you begin to say that to your soul, to your heart, I believe you will begin to believe it. There is no sin I cannot forgive. Why? Because of what Christ did for me, there is no sin that I cannot forgive someone else. You can forgive anyone of anything, no matter how heinous the crime, when you realize and remember how God in Christ has forgiven you. The person that does not understand this likely does not know Christ as Savior. What am I saying? The person that cannot forgive is not a Christian. It's really that simple. The person that cannot forgive, even though they know that Christ has forgiven them, does not understand the forgiveness of Christ and therefore is likely not a believer. As believers, we understand that forgiveness is not just limitless, but it's also the depth of the sin against us. It doesn't matter how vile the crime. Do you love some of those videos? I've seen some videos on YouTube where a person in a court is being charged with murder, and maybe the mother is there of the person that was murdered, and afterwards, after the sentence, no matter what the sentence was, the mother finds that murderer who murdered their son or their daughter, and they extend forgiveness to them. That is nothing less than supernatural. And you only see it with believers. It's so unique in the Christian faith. See, the person that does that understands that that's where happiness begins. Thirdly, the happy heart understands the importance of forgiveness. We've kind of been alluding to this all throughout. But the negative side of this is that there are some severe consequences in harboring a heart of unforgiveness. It's so important that you forgive, not just because you can have a happy heart if you forgive, but because if you don't forgive, there are some bad things coming your way. Verse 31 through 35 of chapter 18, it says, So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, just, just some clarification. Again, this is not talking about salvation, okay? This is not talking about that Jesus, that God is going to hand you over. If you don't forgive someone, if you don't forgive a brother or sister in Christ, he's not going to condemn you to hell, okay? That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about within the church. This is talking about within the fellowship of believers, and it's discipline, there are several and severe consequences in harboring a heart of unforgiveness. When we fail to forgive, no matter the severity or depth of the sin committed against us, there are some things that happen. Four quick things I want to give you. They're not in your notes, so I encourage you to write them down. That happen when we fail to forgive. Number one, we cause disunity in the church. We cause disunity in the church. In verse 31, it says, So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened. They were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. They were deeply grieved. When these slaves saw their fellow slave not forgive the other slave, they were deeply upset within their hearts. Listen, this is a picture of what it should be like to be a Christian in a local church. When you see someone in sin or when you see someone who has an unforgiving spirit or holding on to a grudge or have bitterness in their heart, it should grieve your heart. Amen? John MacArthur says Christians should be deeply grieved when a fellow believer is unforgiving. Why? Because his hardness of heart not only tends to drive the offender deeper into sin, but also causes dissension and division within the church. 
it tarnishes its testimony before the world, and it deeply grieves the Lord himself. There are devastating ramifications for you if you do not forgive your brother and sister in Christ within the local body of Christ. There just becomes this, this sense, this attitude, this feeling in church when you walk in and that person is standing over there that you haven't forgiven because they did that one thing to you two years ago and you're still holding on to it. It causes disunity within the body of Christ. And the church can't grow in grace and the church becomes stunted in its growth. Verse 31, there's this feeling, there's this, there's this sense of injustice. There's a lot of talk about justice in our world right now. In this verse, he says, so when his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were deeply grieved. Why? Because they knew the king had forgiven that slave of an unpayable debt. And this guy turns around and can't forgive his fellow slave for something simple like a hundred denarii. We do it all the time in the church of God, don't we? We hold on to the most petty little things, and it should grieve our hearts as Christians, and it should drive us. Are you listening? Say amen. It should drive us to go to those people in love, in private, and say, what are you doing? Christ forgave you so much. you got to let this go. you got to forgive this person. It's hurting the church. It's hurting the body. It's hurting the testimony of Christ. People are looking at you and saying, you're that vindictive? I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were forgiven. I thought that God loved you. I thought all these things, and now you're just ruining it because the person didn't say hello to you five years ago. We cause disunity in the church when we harbor hearts of unforgiveness. Secondly, we sinfully disappoint our God. We sin. You can just write those two words. We sin. We sin against God. Verse 32 through 33. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, remember the king is representative of God. You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Do you see the cross? Do you see Christ? Do you see the forgiveness? Verse 33. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? How disappointed the heart of God must be when we fail to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ. Matthew chapter 6 is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. What's the next line? And forgive us our debts. How? As we have forgiven our debtors. Right? And then you look further on in that passage... In verse 14, it says, For if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now look at verse 15. Are you with me? Say amen. But if you do not forgive other people, then then your Father will not forgive your offenses. Again, this this is not talking about salvation. This is talking about relational, relational experience with God. If you harbor sin against your brother or sister in Christ... Even your, a person in your home, a wife, a child, a friend, a co-worker, if you, harbor, if you harbor resentment and bitternesses in your heart and you refuse to forgive them, do you see how that will immediately hinder and block your relationship with the Lord on a relational level? It will cause friction in that relationship. These are the consequences of a heart that harbors unforgiveness. Disunity in the church. Sinfully disappointing our God after all that he has done for us. And thirdly, we incur the discipline of the Lord. We incur the discipline of the Lord. Verse 34 and 35 tells us what the Lord does, what this king does. It said, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. You see, when we harbor unforgiveness, when we refuse to forgive, the Lord will, everybody say will. He will discipline us. Our sin always elicits the holy discipline of the Lord. As Hebrews 12, 6 says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. That is, those that are the Lord's, if you're a child of God, he's going to discipline you. When I'm in sin and I know I'm in sin, you know what I'm always looking for? Uh Uh-oh. What are you going to do to me, Lord? 
Not in terms of punishment, but if I continue in sin, I'm not talking about a one-time sin or a sin here or a sin there. I'm talking about I know I'm choosing to sin, and it's repetitive day after day, month after month, year after year. I know it's against the will of God. I know it's against the word of God. I know it's against the plan of God, and I do it anyways. If I am a child of God, the word of God promises that God will discipline me. He'll either discipline me or take me out completely. That is, kill me, and he has every right to do so. The Lord disciplines those he loves. See, there will be times in our lives when we fall into the sin of unforgiveness. And it is a sin. Every one of us will fall into that sin. Sometimes for minutes, sometimes for hours, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks, maybe months, maybe years. We all will fall into the sin of unforgiveness. But listen, listen, the Lord will not permit us to stay there. He will not allow it. Because of the grace that was shown to you, because of the forgiveness that was shown to you, it brings so much dishonor to his name. When the child of God, who has been forgiven of an unpayable debt, refuses to forgive a brother or sister in Christ, the Lord will not permit us to stay with an attitude of unforgiveness. These are the consequences of an unforgiving heart. We cause disunity in the church. We sinfully disappoint God. We incur the discipline of the Lord. And then fourthly, We do damage to our own happiness. This is what this series is all about. You want to be happy? Forgive. When you don't forgive, you do damage to the prospect of being happy. Lord Herbert once said, He who cannot forgive others breaks the bridge over which he himself must pass. Someone once said, I don't know who this was by, I never found the author of the quote, he said, Revenge, indeed, seems often sweet to men, but, oh, it is only sugared poison, only sweet and gall, and its aftertaste is bitter as hell. You're only doing damage to yourself. We've all heard the quote about if you don't forgive someone, if you hold bitterness in your heart towards someone, you're drinking poison, right, and expecting what? The other person to die. It's what you're doing when you harbor sin in your heart. Another illustration I thought of, I saw online this week. How much water is in this glass? There's definitely water. How much now? (laughs) Any guesses? How much water? Anybody? How about an ounce? You see, ultimately... This glass is not that heavy. There's a little less than 16 ounces in this glass. It's not about the weight. It's about how long you carry the weight. With bitterness, with unforgiveness in your heart, it might be the littlest of things. Just 16 ounces of water. Guess what? My shoulder is starting to burn. (laughs) My arm is starting to get tired. And what God wants us to do with even the littlest of things in our hearts, with the bitterness, with the unforgiveness, is just, for goodness sake, put it down. Don't add that stress to your life. Don't add that grief, that unnecessary grief to your life. When simply forgiving someone, remembering what Christ has done for you, can alleviate some of those stresses in your life. Why carry around needless weight, needless stress, when it's so simple to get rid of it by forgiving? You see, we damage and we delay our own happiness the more we hold on to, no matter how small. Warren Wearsby said the world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiving heart. The world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiving heart. You see, it is for your own soul's happiness that you must forgive. Amen? It's not even for the other person. It's for you. Lastly, number four, the happy heart understands the source of forgiveness. In verse 35, it says, My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother. What are those last three words, church? From your heart. What does that mean? Here's what it definitely does not mean. It does not mean from your own personal heart. It does not mean that you can forgive 
from your own nature. We as believers, I as a Christian, am incapable of forgiveness in and of myself. That's why if you're honest and you've been sitting here this morning, somebody came to your mind and you're like, yeah, but, but, but you don't understand. <laughs> you don't know what they did. You don't know what they said. Or maybe it's just this overall feeling. Nobody's coming to mind, but it's just an overall feeling of, man, I, this, is, this, is too, this is too difficult. And to that I say amen. You're right. It's too hard. It's too difficult by human means. We are incapable of forgiveness in and of ourselves. That's why Galatians 5, 16 and 17, Paul says, we looked at 17 earlier, 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Why? For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Again, it goes back to that war within us. The reason you have such a hard time and I have such a hard time forgiving people it's because of our flesh, because of our sin nature. It's who we are at our deepest core. Yet, we now have something to fight against that. We have someone to fight against that. That is the Spirit of God who lives within us. Amen? The Christian only forgives through the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit within us. That's the only way this happens. Romans 8, 5-6 through 6 gives us some practical insight into how this actually happens. It says, Paul says, those who live according to the flesh, you want to live in unforgiveness? Here's how you do it. You have your mind set on what the flesh desires. You just want revenge. You want them to pay. You want them to show respect. You want them to say they're sorry. You want to embarrass them. You want to say to them, ha, I got the last laugh. That is all from the flesh. And it is not to be the characteristic of a believer in Christ. He continues, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit, if you want to learn how to forgive, and this goes for all things, all sins, all, all things that God commands us to do, those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. That means the Word of God. That means the Spirit of God prompts you. You need to forgive them. I can't. I, I don't want to. I don't like what they did to me. I don't like them. I don't want to be around them. Okay. You still are called by the Spirit of God within you to forgive them. Verse 6, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. You want to be happy? You want life? You want peace? You want joy? Forgive. It's that simple. Now, some of you are in here and you're like, I've forgiven everybody in my past. And tomorrow, somebody's going to do something and be like, boom. And you're going to be like, ugh, I, I think I just heard something about this. But I don't want to do that. Set your mind in accordance with the things of the spirit. Set your mind... On obeying God. The great commentator William Arnott told the following account to illustrate how believers are enabled to obey the command to forgive each other. This is such a difficult thing to do for every single one of us. How do we do it? Here's an account he gives. After fording a river, a traveler in Burma discovered that his body was covered with small leeches. How many of you just disconnected? Done. <laughs> Blah, right? Busily sucking his blood all over his body, right? He says his first impulse was to pull them off. But his guide warned him against it, explaining that to do that would leave part of the leeches buried in the skin and cause serious infection. Completely done now, right? That's disgusting. That's gross. I cannot even fathom what that would be like. The native prepared a warm bath for the man and added certain herbs to the water that irritated but did not kill the leeches. And one by one, they voluntarily dropped off. He gives us the meaning. Each unforgiven injury rankling in the heart is like a leech sucking the lifeblood from your heart. Mere human determination to have done with it will not cast the evil thing away. You must bathe your whole being in God's pardoning mercy and forgiveness. And those ven venomous creatures will instantly let go their hold. How do you forgive? You bathe yourself in how Christ has forgiven you. You remember the cross. You think of all of your sin that you have committed against a holy and righteous and loving God. And as you see what God has done for you, it enables you. 
to forgive others. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? As God in Christ forgave you. We reflect God's forgiveness because we have experienced God's forgiveness through Christ. Amen?